All right, so um, we're looking at part three of Jesus Day of All Things. Now, Samuel, after this session, I'll do it. Okay. Stay, stay till after the session and listen to what the Word of God is saying. Yeah? Just mm -hmm. open your heart. You'll receive the Word, the right Word. And at the okay. end, we're going to pray. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Praise praise God. So, Jesus Christ, the hell of all things. Hebrews 1, 2. The Bible says, but to us living in these last days, God now speaks to us openly in the language of His Son, the appointed hell of everything. For through Him, God created the panorama of all things and all time. My assumption is that you can see my screen, correct, everyone? Yeah. All right. Okay. So last week, I know we started talking about, you know, Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit, which I said I'm going to talk about at some other time. But so I'm not going to be talking about that today, but we're going to talk about that. I say what I've decided to do with that topic about the Trinity is to do it as a Sunday series, you know, like maybe one of these Sundays in March on Sundays on 3 p.m. We just do it over a, a month, just do that series, you know, uh, the Trinity series uh, on, on in March. Okay, so please look out for that. Okay, so Jesus Christ is appointed hair of everything. Um, and the key word there is appointed. You know, when I went to check this word appointed, it means ordained, ordained the hair of everything. And I think what I was trying to say last week, just to be, make it easier, was that we know from John chapter one verse one that Jesus Christ, uh, Jesus Christ, was with God and is with God and continue to be with God. You know, the Bible says he was with God in the beginning. Um, the Bible also says there's nothing that was made that was made without him. The Bible also says in the book of John that in him was life and that life was the light of men. All right, so essentially, Christ was with God. Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God was with god right from the beginning in fact in the book of proverbs i believe chapter 8 talks about wisdom was there when the earth was being formed and this wisdom is personified as the lord jesus so there cannot be any creation without jesus all right but the word appointed here could mean mean, mean two, means two things one is is ordained as the hell of everything, which means everything that God did or the God does or God will ever do, he does for Jesus, period, right? But Jesus Christ as the eternal son of God has always existed right from the beginning before the world was created. In fact, he is the creator of all things. Through him, God created the panorama of all things. That's what the scripture is saying. We're going to look at Jesus Christ, the creator of all things in subsequent uh, teachings. So, but today is about Christ is appointed heir of everything. So why and how was he, was he appointed? If you look here, the appointed heir of everything, for through him, God created the panorama of all things. So you could say Christ was appointed heir of everything because it is through him. The word for here could also mean because, okay? He was appointed heir of everything. Why? Because it is through him that God created the panorama of all things and all time. And that's very that's very straightforward. And this particular view aligns with John chapter one verse one, when the Bible says, "In the beginning was God, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God." Okay, all right. So Christ is appointed heir of everything because through Him God created the panorama of all things and on all time. So when God said, "Let there be light," it was Jesus, the Son of God, that God spoke out of His mouth that who then impacted the holy spirit who was brooding over the surface of the deep and then creation happens and that tells us that nothing is ever created without the spoken word in john chapter 1 verse 1 uh, i think tama if you are there john 1 1 that's why john chapter 1 let's just go back to quickly go to john chapter 1 verse 1 nothing is ever created without the word John chapter 1, verse 1 to verse 3. Okay. In the beginning, the word already existed. The mm -hmm. word was God, and the word was God. Mm -hmm. He existed in the beginning with God. Mm -hmm. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. Praise God. So this is saying that everything was created by 
the word and this word is jesus right okay this word is jesus okay now so now what we're saying here is that because the, everything was created by jesus god appointed him as the hell of everything okay that's one view that's one view and that view is correct so which means jesus christ is a hair is a hair and lawful owner of all things okay now but the word hair like last we were talking about is somebody who inherits all the estate somebody who inherits what the father has or what the parent has got what the parents have you know that's what an heir is and there's a person who's inherits all which means what the father is has done what the father has created it, 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 it the father is created those things because of the son the son is the one who inherits all those things so when we the bible says just christ is the hair of everything it's talking about just christ is the one who inherits all the father has all the father has now in hebrews chapter 1 verse 4 i saw something there that i just want to call out what did jesus inherit hebrews 1 4 says hebrews 1 4 in the passion translation i have it on the screen here it says jesus christ is infinitely greater than the angels for in he, he inherited a rank and a name far greater than than theirs he just christ is greater than the angels for in he inherited a rank and a name greater than theirs the name that christ inherited is the name and the rank that he has is far greater than any other name that anybody or any other angel could have it is even ink it doesn't even make any sense to compare jesus and the angels because even the angels were created by jesus all right so here i have a point that says jesus christ towers above all and he also has a name above all so when god appointed him as heir of all things he gave him a rank and a name above all things so just guys had us two things one is a rank the other is a name and the name that he has is a name that is greater than any other name in the universe whatever it is that has got a name the name of jesus is higher than that name whether it is sickness whether it is coronavirus whether it is um you know joblessness or poverty or anxiety or anger whatever whatever it is in this world that has a name the name of jesus is greater than these things praise god now the other point to note is christ inherited a rank and this is beautiful he inherited a rank that is higher than the angels i've got a question for you is satan an angel or not yes is satan an angel or not yes you, satan you is an angel satan is a good satan uh, as a created being was created an angel all right so you see um um i've got um the bible said that satan was a cherubim according to revelation 28 and um, ezekiel 28 okay boy z boy, boy boy he transformed himself into an angel of light okay. according to you know second corinthians chapter 12. okay you know so, so it was it was original a, a cherubim that okay. was in the father's because cherubims are different from you know angels have different levels Okay, where I'm you know, going, well, in terms of Satan specifically, you yeah. know, it was it was created a cherub. Yeah. Okay, where I'm going is this. Yeah. Um Satan, whether I cherubim or angel, is created, right? And because the Bible here says in verse three, all things, John 1 3, all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. The all things include everything. So everything was made by the son. The Bible here now says the son is infinitely greater than the angels. 
So when somebody says the Satan, that Satan is running after me, or I am afraid of the devil, the question is, who do you carry? If the person that you carry is infinitely, you see, there's a word here, use the word here is infinitely, right? This is a key word, sorry. It's, it's, it's a great word here, infinitely, which means, I don't know what infinitely means to you, but what it means to me, that which is incomparably greater and cannot be compared. But you know, the Bible there says, Christ in you, Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ in the believer is the hope of glory. So if Christ is the one through whom God created all things, and all things include everything, including Satan, terrible seraphim, and all kind of celestial bodies. It means Christ is far, 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 infinitesimally, if, you know, infinitely greater than the devil. In fact, it is insultive to compare Jesus and the devil. And that's the reason why in the book of Matthew chapter 4, when the devil came to tempt Jesus, and he said, all of this will I give to you. Just bow down and worship me. Jesus Christ says to him, Get thee behind me, Satan. For it is written, Only God shall you worship. Essentially saying, How could I, who created you, be the one to worship you? But, but what does this mean for us? This Revelation, what does it mean for us as children of God? The Father Christ has a name that is higher than everything. He has a rank higher than everything. What does it really mean for us in the practical times? If I am going for an interview and there's somebody there, or, or I have a I had a dream where somebody is chasing me in the dream, and I wake up and I'm palpitating. What does this sentence, this revelation, what does it mean to me that Christ has inherited a name that is greater than any other name in the world? What is the practical realization that I can use in with this realization to live life in a way that makes me victorious? Who can help me? Who can help me here? Who can try? Uh, Knowing that um, you are an heir with this with the son. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So when I know, what does it do for me? I've I've just checked up the definition of infinitely, and mm. infinitely means without limit. One, one of the definitions is without limit. There's no limit. Yeah. So, so there's, so, yeah, go on. So if you know that you are in Christ and Christ is in you, mm. you have therefore got in you the one who has no limit. Therefore, mm -hmm. you, you plus the one who has no limit, there is absolutely, absolutely no limit. Therefore, whatever challenge you face, you know you have got the one in you who has no limit and therefore you are already a winner. So if, okay. you go, so if you ask you a question about going for an interview, yeah, you would go there knowing that you know if I want this job, it's mine. Okay, but 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 if this is not my experience, mm. what could be the problem? If 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 I understand this mm. in my head, yeah, but it's not my day-to-day -day experience, what could be the problem? Um. Your your mind and what you have been taught, the wrong teaching that nice. you know. Okay. All right. Thank you, Janie. All right, Arisi, you wanted to say something? Yeah, um, another problem could be um just to add what Jane says. Um um first Corinthians chapter 15, yeah, um, verse 2. It yeah. says, it said, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I have preached unto you, mm -hmm. unless you have believed in vain. Yeah. So in other words, that you know, what do we what do we know? Mm. That is what we remember before we, we know mm. that we can we call back. Okay. 
So and let's play, let, you know we in. let's yeah. let's play back now to this. Uh, you're going for an interview and you're almost panicking. How will I take using First Corinthians fifteen to bringing to remembrance what you have been taught, knowing that the name that is given to Jesus Christ, the name that's higher than every other name. How do I use? How do I make this work for me? How do I make this work for me? Confessing. Yes, go on. Go on. It. By confessing it, we speak it. By speaking it, by believe. So uh, Harrison said, believe in it. So, uh, Thomas says to confess it. And both both of you are right. Both of you are right. Okay. Who else can help? Both of you are right. Yeah, but who else can add a little bit more to that? It's Bible study. It's Bible study, folks. Oh, I think, um, hi, it's yeah. just Chi here. I was just going to say, yeah. Yeah, yeah. sorry, sorry, I joined late. Um, it's fine. Question? I think it's really important. I think that um, bearing in mind the struggle, of, of course, we're, we're also flesh beings, right? That's um, right. And we have to take that into consideration. I think we have to go beyond our flesh and not just reflecting on these statements and stating them. I think that we have to try to be them. It's almost like we have to, I don't want to say pretend because it's not really a pretend thing. Mm. It's, it is what we are through Jesus Christ because that's what the Bible tells us. It's almost like we have to just be it. And I always like, I always, um, I can't remember where I heard this from, but um, now I have a child, I'm able to really see it. And mm -hmm. it's almost like how she just has so much confidence mm -hmm. in herself, in the love of her parents. I think that we have to just adopt that. Like when it comes to being heirs of, 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 of God Almighty, we need to be like little children who mm -hmm. don't really have any, thing encumb um, encumbering their understanding we just have to go transcend our physical understanding and just mm. just believe it it's just accept it the same way we accept our names or whatever it is same way we accept our sex or gender we just mm. have to mm. accept it like as it, almost like a no-brainer type of thing it's very difficult i don't know how i'm mm. hoping i will learn how to practically do that today but i think that's what we need to do but doing it is a different story, I guess. Okay, thank you very much. That really, that really blessed me. You know, so we, you've you've all said the same thing, which is very, which is essentially, be a doer of the word. Do what the word says. So in Book of James, chapter one, verse twenty-two, the Bible says, um, "You don't be a, a hearer of the word only, deceiving yourself." Say, so be a doer of the word, and the word doer of the word is the word that is called be a poetic be a poetic performer of the word so when god says you should be a doer of the word he's saying don't just be a hearer of the word alone be a doer put the word to use don't wait until the until you feel that the word is correct before you put it to use put it to use based on what you have heard it is by putting it to use that you will prove to yourself that it works. So if somebody is going for an interview and is sort of panicking or thinking, oh, this is not going to work, take a moment. Take a moment to be alone. You know, an ex exercise that I do, and this might not work for everybody, this is a portion of scripture in Revelation chapter 5 that describes the throne of God. You know, on that throne, the Bible says there is one who is sat on the throne. The Bible says heaven and earth fled away from his presence. And then you have all the creatures and you have the, the angels, Daniel, the elders, 24 elders in heaven. You have all those people around the throne. There's a throne in heaven that describes the throne of God. When at times when I am afraid or I find myself feeling like, oh man, um, what's going on here? I go to that scripture in Revelation chapter five, and I imagine myself in the presence of God in in that inside that throne. Again, like I said, it's, it might not work for everybody. I'm gonna tell you what works for me. All right, and I say, stand in front of that throne. I begin to reaffirm the promises of God. Greater is He who is in me than He who is in the world. You know, Christ died for me. 
um, seated together with Christ in the heavenly places. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I begin to say these things. God has not given the spirit of fear, but of love, burdens, and a sound mind. If I don't want I might say it. 50 times, you know, I would, I would just say, I have a sound mind. I have boldness. I have a sound mind. I have boldness. Greater is he who lives in me than he who is in the world. But all the time, I see myself in the throne room. And as I rehash over and over those promises of God, the Bible says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, which means as I say those things, I build myself up. All right. And because I'm, I've got God now, this throne of God, right in my consciousness, I elevate, in my mind, God is elevated above that problem. And then I'm able to move forward. Another thing you could do is if you do speak in tongues, you could speak in tongues. You could spend some time speaking in tongues, you know, um, as you face us and just speak in tongues. Because the Bible say we should speak in tongues to build up our own most holy faith. We build ourselves up, all right, speaking in tongues. All right, then the third thing you could do when you face, when you do that kind of thing is you could just start to praise God. You spend some time just praising God. When you because what you praise, you elevate. What you praise, you you promote. Once you praise something, you are promoting it. And this is the reason why when I use the example of we should not be comparing Satan and Jesus earlier, is because a lot of time we speak about what the devil is doing. Mm. Because we speak about what the devil is doing, unconsciously we are we are promoting the devil above God. When we're constantly talking about, oh, the devil is after me, look at what the devil is doing. We are, um, we're saying, as children of God, we're almost saying the devil has more power than God. It, but that's not what we, that's not, that's not what we intended. But that's the way it sort of come out in the realm of the spirit. We're always talking about what the devil is doing. But if you know in the book of Revelation, the Bible says they overcame the devil by the blood of the lamb and the words of their testimony, which means they keep saying what God is doing, even when it doesn't look like anything is happening. So our confession of the victory of Jesus or, or, or the victory that we have in Jesus in the face of challenges will help us to do what? To build up our faith. Because what we're saying there, we're saying that the word of God is true, even though we might not be experiencing it. All right. Now, as we say those things over and over and over out of our mouths, our ears will hear those words. It will go back into our heart and it will become a belief system. As we keep saying, declaring the promise of God over and over, 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 over out of our mouth, and our ears are hearing it, going back to our heart, it becomes a belief system. And when it becomes a belief system, it is automatic. Right. Now, the other thing I will say, which is very important, don't come into a place and hear the message that builds you up. And then the next week, you are going to hear a message that will sow fears into, fear into your heart. Then you are totally messing up what you are trying to build. If you come to a place and now they, they told you God is good, and all you hear is about God is good, the goodness of God, and you, you, you're so pumped up, you are going and you're taking over the world. And the next instance, you, you hear something, like, oh, God is a consuming fire, and they're you're hearing those messages over and over again, then your heart is confused. Your heart is saying, which one should I believe? Here they tell me God is a good God. Here they say, oh, God is going to kick you out. Which, which one is which? So if you want your faith to grow, you must do what? You must ensure that you embrace the mind that is that of God. Now, let me show you something that I, I found out today. I hope I can find Acts 20.32. Acts 20.32. Acts 20, 20, 32. The Bible says, Acts 20, 32. Bible says, I'm reading the Passion Translation. I don't know where you can see my screen, but it's saying, and so now I entrust you into God's hands and the message of his grace, which is all that you need to become strong. All of God's blessings are imparted through the message of his grace which he provides as a spiritual inheritance given to all of his holy ones. Do you understand what this is saying? Who can help me with this Acts 20.32? What is it? What is the what is he saying? What can you get out of this Acts 2032? Um my version. Yeah. Um that I'm reading. Which version um, is that? Which I'm using AKJV. Okay, tell me um, what. Yeah. It says, it says, and now, Bridget, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, 
which is able to build you up and to give you an inherent an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Yeah. Okay. So what do you get from it? Um it's, it's telling me that you know the word of God is more than enough to build me up and to but, give me my to deliver to me my inheritance. Okay. <laughs> if I just only believe it. Okay. But which word of God is he saying? Look at it carefully. It's very important. You know, it's not saying the word, the word, I, the word of his grace. Exactly. That's what he's saying. It's not saying I commend you to the word that will put condemnation on you. That's not what he's saying. He's saying here yeah. only word that can build you up. The only word that can make you a partaker of the inheritance that Christ has given you is the word of grace. There's no other word. There's no other word that can build you up. Amen. It is very important. You see, so what I'm saying earlier is don't say, oh, I'm going to church. I'm hearing the message. What are you hearing? Are you hearing the message of grace that is telling you now there's no condemnation? If you if you have if you have not been part of this teaching, there's there's a number of teaching that was there's on YouTube that I call the language of a son. I spoke about the language that God now speaks in to us in Christ Jesus, and it's the language of a son. And the language one of the language of this of, of the son is, "You are my beloved child. In you I am I am well placed." That's the word that God says to you right now. The same word that God says to Jesus, He says to you. When Christ was coming out of the water, the Bible said the heaven opened. And he heard, this is my beloved son, a woman well placed. And actually, in other translation, it says, this is my beloved son. Son, In him, I have great delight. And, and we, we, we ask you to write an affirmation that says, I bring God great delight. I think at times we might struggle to say that. But do you know that is the truth? Mm. What is able to build you up is the message of his grace. And the Bible here says, listen to what the Bible is. This passage says, it is all that you need to become strong. That's all you need. The message of grace is all that you need to become strong. Why? Because all of God's blessings are imparted only through the message of his grace. Not the message of performance. Not the message of trying to please God by doing. It is a message of his grace, of the finished work of Jesus Christ at Calvary. The message of his grace is that Christ became sin for us and he died in our place and he, he impacted to us perfect righteousness. The message of his grace that is able to, to build you up, make you to be strong in, in the work of faith, is to know that God now sees you the same way he sees Jesus. Is to know that God loves you the same way he loves Jesus. Is to know beyond any shadow of doubt, regardless of the way you feel, that you are not precious in his sight. That is the message that is able to build you up. That is the message that is able to impact all of the blessings of God. But remember, those blessings are already provided for you by your father. You are not begging God to get those blessings. They are already there. But this is still telling you the vehicle through, through which you are going to embrace those, that spiritual inheritance has already been given to all of his holy ones. Look at what God calls you here. He called you what? The holy one. So if I tell you now and say, if you are a believer and you're on the call, and I say to you, you are holy and righteous, will you believe that? Will you look at it and say, how can I be righteous? How can I be holy? But this is what God called you. God says you are holy. Why did he say you are holy? Because now you are joined here with Jesus. God can only see you today, my brothers and sisters, through the lens of Jesus. There is no other lens through which God can see you. The only lens through which he can see you is through the lens of Jesus. And that's the reason why you can come to the place of prayer and know that God is going to answer you. That is why when you are facing that challenge, you can come boldly to the throne room of grace and receive help that you need in time of trouble. Why? Because the message of his grace is the only thing that can make you strong and that can make you to what embrace the blessings that are already yours. Praise God. Any question? Any comment on that one? Any contribution? This week I've been meditating this the difference between law and grace uh, based on the there's a verse, I think we discussed it here. John 1.17. Yeah. 
Yeah. I think it says that for the law was given through Moses, but yeah. grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Yeah. And I, I saw it this week and I said the law was given. And I just thought of somebody, you know, if you give something away, like I can, I can send you something, I put it in the post and I'm giving it to you. I send it through somebody. So I've sent a messenger to bring you something. In this case, the postman. But when Jesus came, he didn't send the message. He actually came and he brought it himself. So it says, but mm -hmm. grace and truth came through Jesus. So he actually comes, knocks at your door. I mean, there are verses that tell us he's knocking at our door. We let him in. He comes in and sits with us and he opens up. The, the, it's like having a guest in your house. He actually brings it himself. And that is the specialness between grace and law. So, so the grace is so much better than the law. The law was just sent. Mm. You know, people did not even see God's face. They did not want to see. He was on the top of a mountain. He was somewhere. He sent it through Moses. But grace actually comes and sits with you. And he says, I have come and commune you. It's just so much better than the law. It's just been playing on my mind this week. Yeah, so, so, so. You, it's just, I, I was just reading it and it just jumped out at me. So the grace, grace is so much more personal. Yeah. Grace is the person of Jesus Christ. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Grace is the person of Jesus Christ. And that's why, you, you know, in, in, in that Hebrew that we read earlier, in the Hebrew chapter 1, verse 1, it says that God has hundred times and diverse man has spoken to the prophet, to the fathers by the prophet, mm. right? But in this last day, he, he speaks openly in the language of his son. Whom he has appointed her to be the heir of all things, by whom he created the heavens, uh, but in whom he created everything. You know, what he's saying is that during it, up until Jesus Christ came, mm. nobody truly knew God as Father. Yeah, he nobody. was sending, sent, he was sending mess through messages. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so they they only know portions, portions of the truth. Yeah, portions, portions of the truth. But in God, in Christ, God showed Himself. Mm. so if you want to know who god is you don't need to look too far look at the person the lifestyle of jesus look at how jesus christ relates related to the pharisees related to the sinners related to the woman caught in adultery related mm. to people who are who were born blind or who had sickness that is god at work mm. and therefore when any anything wants to play in your oh god is this god is that just go back and look at jesus but then you said you're gonna alter the who things. Somebody, please, somebody, you want to be on mute? So, 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 so just go back. Thank you. So, so just, just go back and look at at Jesus. All right, yeah. go back and look at Jesus. Look at the, look at the person of Jesus. Don't don't look don't look at God. I, I think I, I wrote it somewhere. I said, don't look at God through the eyes of Elijah. Mm -hmm. Don't look at the eyes of Elisha. You see, there are great men of God that God used. God used them. Right? But but they are not they are not the full picture. I, and I give an example one of the teaching. I said, Elijah called fire down from heaven to burn the sacrifices to prove. That God is a God of fire, whatever. God of fire, he, 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 whose God consumes the sacrifice by fire is the real God. And God answered. He was the same God that answered and consumed the sacrifice by fire. But when in the book of John, when Jesus Christ was about to go to Jerusalem and he was to pass through Samaria, and the Samaritan would not allow Jesus Christ to stay there, and the apostles were so upset and say, Jesus, should we call down fire down from heaven to consume these people just like Elijah did? And Jesus Christ said, you do not know the spirit that you carry. Mm. Essentially, he's saying, if Elijah operated in the dispensation of grace, he would not need to call fire down from heaven to prove that God is, God is a powerful God. Basically, the law has its, has its position. The law is fundamental. God, the, the law was not, there's nothing evil about the law. But the dispensation of the law has come to an end. Why? Because now we are in the Son. The Son is the embodiment of whatever the law demanded from us. Christ fulfilled it. I'm going to show you a scripture here. Mm -hmm. In I think in Romans. Uh, let me just find it out. Romans. Um, can I can I say something? 
Yes. Um, um, you know, um, uh, you know, when I read um, Romans chapter six, yeah. you know, when he says um, you are not under the law, but under grace, mm. you know, I always see a picture of the Holy Spirit taking a stone, which is labeled the law in a, in a, in a fish pond, like a, like a jar. And mm. he took the stone and put the stone in the grace pond. So anything that I see in that pond is grace now. So grace, so basically, you know, I don't see the law because I'm not under it anymore. I'm not over the water of law anymore. So I cannot even see it. I can't even feel, you know, whether what what particular, but since it's put me under grace, it means that I'm over, on in that pond of grace, anything that's connected to that to that grace pond mm. is belongs to me. Yeah. Yeah. So 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 look at look at this. Um I don't know if anybody can see my screen. Thank you, Harrison. Thank you so much. Yeah, so we have been translated. And if you look, if you read the book of Colossians, chapter two, I think from verse 13 to 15, it's very clear about what God did to the law. It's very, very clear. You know, remember, there's nothing, there's nothing evil about the law at all. You know, it's just that we cannot fulfill the law by ourselves. It's not possible. There are over 630 laws in the Old Testament. And the, God, the Bible says, if you, if you fail in one, you fail in all of them. Yeah. But the question is, is God trying to say the law is, 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 is evil? No. Look at what the Bible says in Romans 8 here. It says, the case is now closed. There remains no accusing voice of condemnation against those who are joined in life union with Jesus, the anointed one. For the law of the spirit of life flowing through the anointing of Jesus has liberated us from the law of sin and death. So there's a law of the spirit. There's a law of sin and death. The law of the spirit, which is the one that we, we got when we gave our life to Jesus Christ, liberated us, which means set us free from the law of sin and death. Why? Because God achieved what the law was unable to accomplish. Because the law was limited by the weakness of human nature. Essentially, God's laws were perfect, but the our human flesh is weak. We cannot, the human flesh without the Holy Spirit, it's not possible to fulfill the laws of God. It's just not possible. So God accomplished what the law could not achieve. How did God do that? God sent his son in the in human form to identify with this weakness that we have in our bodies. Clothed with humanity, God's son gave his body to be the sin offering so that God could once and for all condemn the guilt and power of sin. So the moment Christ was, was became a sin offering at Calvary, to God did something. God condemned the guilt and the power of sin over your life. So now, now, every righteous requirement of the law, what the law demands is fulfilled, can be fulfilled through the anointed one living his life in us. And we are free to live, not according to our flesh, but by the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit. Essentially saying, Christ fulfilled the law for you. All the just requirement of the law that, I, that the law demands that you must fulfill, Christ already fulfilled them. And because he fulfilled them and he lives inside of you, you have already obeyed the laws of God. You have already fulfilled them. The Lord no longer serves as an accusing finger that says, thou shalt not, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. Why? Because Christ fulfilled the laws on your behalf. The laws of God are righteous and holy and perfect. God ordained those laws. But without the power of the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us, we cannot live by those laws. That's, that's why God says, you know what? Let me send my son. My son lived Christ lived under the law, by the way. Christ Jesus lived under the law and he fulfilled the law completely 100%. When the Bible says he has, he have not, I have not come to do away with the law to, but to, to fulfill it, what he's saying is I've come to bring the, the purpose for which, which the law was set up, I have come to fulfill it. I've come to bring it to a completion. Now, if you are stepping into the shoes of somebody who already accomplished the law, there's no work for you to do because it has already been done for you. Your job is to allow the Christ who now lives inside of you to, to, to live out, outside for the world to see. All right, praise God. Okay, Mike, I got four more minutes. Let's go back here. 
Jane, thank you for the for the um, for the uh, comments. Now here, what I said here, Jesus does not just Jesus owns all things, right? But he doesn't lord his inheritance over us. Jesus Christ serves us with everything he has. All right. Why does he do that? Because he loves us. We are not the property of Jesus like a slave. We are his joy like a family. I want that. I want you to ponder out that. I think she mentioned something about now that I have a child. You know, you know there's a way she feels. The way she begins to feel about when now she, she she's a parent. She can see that's my baby. You know, I was telling my wife this morning, saying, if you ask me and say, what is what is your number one? delight what is it i say my children my I, you know when i think about my children i just think you know that's that's the future right now you think about the way i feel about my children or the way you feel about your children if you have children i know some of us may we may not have children yet you know but if you have been part of a family where you have been loved there's a way that, that there's, there's a feeling inside now think of how much god yeah <laughs> compared the way you feel multiply that by infinity that's how god feels about you you are family you are not a servant you are family you belong in the house you are god's child god loves you god is not tolerating you god is not looking you over for fault i say oh look at what he did yesterday look at what you two days ago no mm. you are family that's why romans 8 1 says there's therefore now no condemnation no accusation no voice of accusation why because you're in christ jesus now the last passion of this thing as i round up is this you see here the bible says hebrews 1 4 christ is infinitely greater than angels for he inherited a rank that rank gives him access to all that god has but apart from that he also inherited a name far greater than theirs so and now here the word name in hebrews 1 4 the word name here in hebrews 1 4 is the word hashem in 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 in, in aramic is the word hashem and is a common title for god and i want to say this emphatically as we close when god when the bible said god gave Jesus christ a name higher than every other name essentially god gave jesus his own name this elevates the meaning of the passage much more clearer than the greek where that the new testament was was written in for jesus christ now is being given the name that is a title of god he has the name hashem now last week we look at philippians 2 6 to 10 if you remember and we went back to the bottom of it and we said every tongue we proclaim in every language jesus christ is lord yahweh bringing glory and honor to god the father and i said the word yahweh there again is the name of god the word yahweh is the hebrew name for jesus which is yeshua right god is a saving cry and this name bears and refuse and reveals the name yahweh so jesus carries the name and reputation of his father yahweh within him now here's the beautiful thing if we are joined here with jesus it means the one that you carry is yahweh himself the one that you carry is Hashem himself. That is the one you carry. You belong in the royal household of God. You are not a mistake, brothers and sisters. You are not somebody who, who is helpless. I said that last time we met. You are not helpless. You have authority of that name. That name is yours to use. And, and I think in one of my posts, I said something. I said, the same way is going to be inconceivable for you to beg your father to use his name you know he, 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 uh, you know let's say my name is okay my name is davis bamboe now i have to say that is it possible uh, do you think i should use, please let me use your name let me use your name let me just use this bamboe that is that is stupid i mean that is inconceivable why because that's my father's name that name belongs to me the same way i don't have to beg my own earthly father to use his name you don't have to or to use the name of Jesus. The name is given to you. The Bible says in Luke here, I've got a note here I want to show you quickly. In, in Luke chapter 12, verse 32, in the Passion Translation, the Bible says, don't ever be afraid, dearest friends. 
your loving father joyously gives you his kingdom realm with all of his promises in another translation he says it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom what is the kingdom the kingdom is everything that god is and everything that god has the kingdom realm of god belongs to you and i so how do we make this name work for us as we go for an interview how do we make this name work for us as we go maybe go pray for someone who is sick how do we make this name work for us to display excellent service at work in the workplace how do we make this name work for us to bear fruit in the marketplace how do we make this name work for us what this name represent work for us in the way we raise up our children in the way we relate with our siblings how can we use this name to work for us all right i want somebody who hasn't spoken before to speak so that's random okay we, we we haven't spoken before. Hello, good evening, everyone. Madam Unike, hi. Thank yeah. you for joining. Thank you. Um, how do we make the name of Jesus work for you? Um, you made reference that that's the name above every other name. Yeah. So one way we can make it work for us is if we find ourselves in a situation whereby um, things are happening that are contrary to God's um, covenant or blessing mm. for us. Yeah, we can either rebuke whatever it is in the name of Jesus, okay, and we can also declare um, who we are in Christ, mm. like positive confession, or also mm. buy and um, lay hold to something we want or the covenant um, God has given us in the name of Jesus and believe it. Mm. And mm. to continuously remind ourselves of who we are in Christ. Amen. I think that's very important. Like you said, um, we have to be conscious of what we are laying importance to. Are we, are we affirming the ills that are happening? Or we are focusing on what God has said concerning us and trusting that to come to pass. So, Amen. That's my Amen. Point. Amen. Amen. All right. Praise God. I love that. All right. So we take charge. Remember, it is by the message of his grace that we are able to do what? Be built up. Right. So we are not doing anything uh, for God to love us. We're not doing any of those things because we're, we're trying to beg God. God already moved before we showed up. All right. We are laying hold of what Christ has already achieved for us. So let us, as we go into this week, let us not carry the vocabulary of defeat that's what i call it either the vocabulary of defeat or vocabulary of failure or vocabulary of satan we are not in that kingdom let's not let's not pander to those conversations let's not anger with people that say those things why because words affect us deeply let us make sure that this week as we go out we remember god has given jesus christ a name that's infinitely greater than every other name and he has been given a rank but not only that, he lives inside of you. He lives inside of you. Colossians 127. We Colossians 127. Who can help me? Colossians 127 as we round up. My time is up now officially. Colossians 127. Colossians 127. God wanted that Colossians. at the riches and glory of Christ are for you, Gentiles, too. And this is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you the assurance of sharing his glory. Christ lives in you. Who can, which, is that the Passion Translation? No, NLT. Okay. Who has, who's got another translation? I've got King James here. Yeah. I should want, do you want me to read it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. And then if anybody has amplified, please. Yeah. Okay. To whom God will make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ is in you. Christ is in you. Beloved, I want us to say together, Christ lives in me. Christ lives in me. Say it like you mean it. Christ, Christ lives in me. Okay, let's do another one. I am the embodiment of God Almighty. 
I am the embodiment of God Almighty. And some people are not very bold in saying that one. Let's try again. I am the I am embodiment, embodiment of God Almighty. God Almighty. That's it. Yes, that's that's who you are. Yes, that's what that means, brothers and sisters. Is when you show up in a place, God shows up. Yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to forget when you show up somewhere, God shows up. Which means if you are working in a company and things are not going well, the moment they hired you, they have to do well. Why? Because God showed up in that place. Am I making sense? Mm. God showed up. Why? Because you carry inside of you God Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. When somebody has, when somebody is going through, even, even be your neighbors, they are, things are not working well in your neighbor's house. You say where you are and you declare and say, I decree by the power of the Holy Ghost, silence in that place, you know, or peace in that home. And then it has to happen. I, I'm not telling what I have not done. I've done it before. You know, some of they'll be making noise somewhere. I just, I just sit down and just pray. I just pray. I just say, evil spirit, whatever is dropping them, I command you to get out. You know, and then we just wait. Send this. God send this. Go out and just do what they got to do. Right? Okay. So what I'm basically saying is that you are a powerhouse because you are in him and it's in you. So I am, you are the embodiment of God Almighty. So as you go out today, Carry that consciousness. Carry that. Say it to yourself over and over and over and over until it sinks in into your subconscious mind. All right. So that when something happens, the first thing that comes out of your mouth is, "No, I'm a child of God. This is not allowed." That is when you know that these things is working. These things are working for you because when when somebody touches you like this, and the first thing that comes out of your mind is, oh, "Come on, where is that coming from? That that's not that's not allowed." Then the word is becoming flesh in your life. Praise God forevermore. All right. So our our takeaway word affirmation this week is, "I am the embodiment of God Almighty." I am the embodiment of God Almighty. Praise God. I am the embodiment of God I am Almighty. The embodiment yeah. of God Almighty. And so as usual, I will put it into a small post. I'll post it. You can use it as your DP, whatever. Say it in the morning. Say it in the night. Say it over, over, and over, and over, and over throughout the week, and then it will be and the word become flesh in your life. Praise God. All right, so I'll stop recording. And then if there's any prayer point, we can take prayer now. I'll stop recording now.